you would open your Bibles to the book of Psalm, specifically the 89th Psalm. The 89th Psalm. This will be our subject this evening as we consider another song that was used in the worship of God in the temple. Now, many of the psalms we've looked at thus far is somewhat short by comparison. This is one of the longer ones. So imagine this being a two-page song in our songbook with five verses. And the song leader leads a little bit slow. So it's going to take us a while to get through this song. In this particular one, though, although it seems to be a little bit longer with about 52 verses there you'll see in your Bible, this is during a time period where Israel is suffering. Um, as a matter of fact, as we get to the end of the chapter, or the latter portion of the chapter, your Bibles may have little subject headings there. But it's going to appear that God has cast off and has forgotten the promises that he made regarding his servant David and the lineage there. Um, quite often the children of Israel would rebel against God and God would punish them. And during their time of reflection upon things that happened, they would often remember the former promises that God had made and then wonder why they were in such a dire situation now. Um, and finally, the true repentance would only come when they finally recognized their state, their loss, and would then repent and come back. And this type of psalm, as we go through here, would be a great generational reminder that is, from generation to generation, of what both God has done and what the people had done. And so, let's go ahead and begin in the first section there. We're going to look at the first four verses here. And you'll notice a little suggested subject heading, God's covenant with David. And then he'll talk about Israel's affliction. First four verses. This is the covenant that God made with David. Let's look at that here. Beginning there in verse 1, we read the following. He says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Verse 2, for I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen, he says. I have sworn to my servant David. Seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Now, when God approached David originally, and this was only after Saul had abandoned his responsibilities as king and had, as far as the obedience unto the Lord, the Lord came to David and approached David about him being the next king of Israel. And you'll notice here there's a, a quick reference there. To 2 Samuel chapter 17. Turn over there for just a moment. We won't spend much time there because I do want to uh, be able to complete the psalm this evening. But go back to the history books there, 2 Samuel, and notice what would be there in chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. In this particular case of point, we have Samuel here coming up to David. And notice, if you would, God's covenant made with David, starting in verse 12. We have here in your days are when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers. I will set up your seed after you, he says, who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. All right. Now, notice that we would think that he might be talking about David during the present day. But we'd have to go back to first Samuel towards the end of that to kind of see um, when Samuel went and picked out David, kind of handpicked him. But here we are coming down towards the end of his life. And the focus of the covenant is this. I will set your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Then verse 13 of 2 Samuel 12, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And then verse 14, I'll be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I'll chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. And so this psalm kind of represents at least the start of it here. 
this promise, the covenant that God had made with David some years earlier. Um, especially there in verse 2. Mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. And he says, I've made my covenant with my chosen. I've sworn to my servant David. And then the idea that your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. So the people recognize that um, while Saul was the first king over Israel, it was really David, a man after God's own heart, where we see this promises of future blessings upon this king's coming in. But here's what we have to keep in mind, though. Oftentimes, the people walked in the direction of the leadership of the kings, okay? So if you had a faithful king, jump forward in time to King Hezekiah, Hezekiah was able to go in and tear out all the high places and everything, and he was able to bring the people back to worship of God. But if you go back to one of his predecessors, Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat tried to make the same changes, or I say he predated Hezekiah, he did. He made the same changes, but he couldn't turn the people's hearts back to God. If you go back and read the story of Jehoshaphat. And so there would be times that God would, in blessing the seed of David, he would have a king upon the throne that would lead the people in a manner of righteousness and God would bless them. But he would also be there to chastise them like a son. So if you had a king that led the people away from God, who um, would lead them into idolatry, then he would punish the people as well. And so going along with the song, we've established kind of looked at this covenant that he made with David. But look at the next section now. We see praise to a faithful and mighty God. And this is what they do here. Um, notice it's interesting what we read and kind of the history that they are reviewing here. But let's start there in verse 5 and read down through verse 18. He says, And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. What a psalm of blessing and of praising God. O Lord God of hosts, verse 8 says, who is mighty like you, O Lord, your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world in all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon rejoice in your name, or Hermon, I guess. You have a mighty strong is your hand, and high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favor our horn is exalted. For our shields belongs to the Lord and our King to the Holy One of Israel. If you ever wonder about the visions that people saw, Ezekiel and um, even Abraham in the vision that the Lord gave him, jump forward to the New Testament, um, what John saw. It's interesting that when you read this description, you kind of see that imagery there a bit. The way that he refers to the greatness of God and the mightiness of God, even to the point of controlling the seas and giving them victory over their enemies. Um, there he says in verse 13, you have a mighty arm, he says. Strong is your hand and high is your right hand. And then he talks about the righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. So we see a beautiful picture imagery here. You can kind of almost see this being sketched out and painted and how they're describing the greatness and how they are describing the glory of God. He is their shield. Um, and in your favor, our horn is exalted, the text says. But now beginning of verse 19, after having this period of praising the Lord within the text, Notice with me the next section, 
they're going to review the promise that God had made with David. And this is why the promise is so significant. It's because it applied to them directly. Uh, if God fulfilled his promise to the descendants of David, then it would directly affect the children of Israel. Um, if he would bless the descendants of David, the, the, the uh, subsequent kings, then he would bless the people. If he punished the kings, then he would punish the people. Well, let's look at the promise here that God made to David and his seed. We'll start there in verse 19. First off, we'll kind of slow this one down a little bit. He writes, Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. Now, the visions are the way that God, or visions were the way, I guess, that God spoke to the prophets of old. There may have been some times of direct communication, but most of the times it was a vision given to them about such and such or about this person or that person. Um, I, I had them out of order earlier. Samuel was the one the Lord went to first when he chose David to take Saul's place. Nathan would be the one to come along later and would also share this communication with David, what he would learn from the Lord. You'll notice on the screen behind me in real tiny letters there, if you can see that. First reference could be what he's talking about, 1 Samuel chapter 16. So leave your markers at Psalms 86, if you would, 89, and turn back in your back to the history book again, going back to 1 Samuel this time around, and let's look at verse 16. Notice here in 1 Samuel chapter 16, in the first three verses here, what is foretold um, regarding David. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. So this is God communicating with Samuel to go and to choose from the sons of uh, Jesse the Bethlehemite, the one who would be the future king. And the Lord's anointed would be David when you looked at that. But... There's also another instance that the writer here in the psalm could be addressing. This time turn now to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And we have this with Nathan. If Nathan sounds familiar, he was a prophet that after David had committed a sin with Bathsheba. About a year, nine months or so, I guess, nine months had gone by. And um, Nathan comes to David and he tells him a story about this wealthy man who's going to entertain visitors. He takes the only sheep of this poor man over here and offers the sheep up as a meal for his visitors. And David, once being a shepherd, was highly enraged at this. And, you know, said, here's the punishment and everything, and laid it down. And then Nathan looked at David and said, you're the man. You're the one that done this. Well, it's very possible that in 2 Samuel 7, verse 17, notice this message here coming through Nathan. He says, um, let's start back up to verse, verse 15. But my mercy will depart from him as I took it from Saul whom I removed from before you saw that earlier and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you your throne shall be established forever according to all these words and according to all this vision so Nathan spoke to David okay so someone says what's the significance there the significance goes back there to verse 19 where he said where the people are recalling these passages um, so that means the psalmist who wrote this or uh, either wrote it by complete without any knowledge of it by inspiration, which we'll say very well could have happened, but he would have had this text and would have been taught the history, known the history about the people there and what God had said and the message that he had delivered to them. And so he reminds the people that this was originally what God had said. So there in verse 20, he says, I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him. Now we jump back to Samuel there and what, and when Samuel chose David. With him my hand shall be established, also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy will not, shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and my name his horn, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. And then verse 25, again, considering God's calling of David, also I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. 
Now we'll stop there for a moment. It's a pretty powerful statement there. But again, it's talking about the responsibility and the authority that God gave to David and to those that would sit upon the throne. But really in David, this is all established. And David's relationship with the Father would be seen within them. You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Now, depending on when this psalm was written, and I couldn't find really a good clarification of that. If it was written after David's death, that he's reminding the people of where it all began with David. All right. And it's very likely that that's the case in point, that it was written well after David's death, many, many years, but reminding the people through this psalm of why they were following God at one time and why they're now being afflicted by God. But the attitude of David, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation is a powerful statement. And it should be one that exists within the hearts of all Christians. We look to our heavenly father. He's our father through the spirit of adoption. Romans chapter eight, Paul explains to us there in that text. He says, also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Someone says, well, it sounds like maybe a messianic prophecy there. And it, as with many of the Psalms, it very well could be. But remember, who was the first king of Israel? Hands go up, it's Saul. No, it was David. Someone says, no, I remember Saul being appointed. David was the first king from the house of Judah. Saul was not from the house of Judah. And yes, he was the first one, and God picked him based on kind of the merits, what the people were looking for. But he rejected Saul, and when he rejected Saul, he rejected the tribe from which Saul had come, as far as future kings coming from that tribe, from that lineage there. So he chose David. So he says there, there again, also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Now, there was a time, especially under Solomon, that the kingdom of Israel reached its apex of influence upon the nations around it. Now, tragically, because of sin, that would soon be diminished and taken away. Um, but as far as the immediate text here, I think he's really talking about David and the kings that would come from him. Um, but again, when you follow the lineage down, what tribe did Jesus come from, effectively? The tribe of Judah, okay? Um, and so that being the case, he also would be in that lineage, and hence the idea in uh, Peter, I believe, Sermon on the Mount, or not Sermon on the Mount, sorry, the day of Pentecost talks about him sitting on the throne of David, being a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, we see kind of the idea there. But the point is God's promise to David and the appointment of David. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne is the days of heaven. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail." And then, two more verses real quick. My covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I've sworn to my holiness, I will not lie to David. Then verse 36 and 37. His seed shall endure forever and is thrown as a sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. Then the pause. So what is their point here? Okay, What is the point of the psalm? Well, initially, they seem to be praising God for what God has done through David for the people. And not just for what he has done, but for the very word that he promised to the people regarding David. Now, it is interesting to note that they did acknowledge that God did promise that if his, his seeds would break his statutes then, and not keep his commandments, then he would punish them. Okay, they knew that. That if the seeds of David, think about the various kings that would come from the lineage of David. They were punished by God because not all of them obeyed his sins. Manasseh passed his children through the fire. And that was so horrific that despite Josiah's best efforts at restoring the people once again to the faithfulness of God, God said basically too far. Manasseh went too far. It was too late. And they would end up going into the Babylonian captivity there. And then uh, he does, and they're reminding him of this of sorts within the psalm. 
God has said, my covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne is a sign before me. Now, this again may have a messianic appearance to it. Because when you stop and think about the lineage there, if you were to trace the lineage of the kings that came from David, coming down to the ones that followed Josiah, just a couple more came later, and then there was no more kings over Israel. No more kings over Judah, officially, all right? As we would once known that it would be, or knew that it was, I should say, until we come to Christ, okay? Until we come to Christ, and he being king over the spiritual, the, the, the house of David, the house of Judah, um, of going all the way back to Abraham, those who are faith of Abraham, all those things we have Jesus now reigning over. So there could be a bit of a messianic prophecy within this idea that his seed shall endure forever and his throne as a son before me. And, and we might want to ask, well, was that conditioned upon their obedience? Well, I don't know about that. Here's why I question it. Within the whole scope of all that design was the Lord punishing them if they did. If they did disobey, he would punish them. And so there's still this promise to David. That's why I say it may be messianic. Looking forward to coming to Christ to serve as our king. Okay. Now, what's the point behind all this? You know, many times when someone comes up to you and says, Hey, you're doing great. You look good today. I've always been impressed by what you know. I've always been in awe at what you do. Somewhere or another, there's going to come a question. But... I got an issue. I got a problem. I need some help or whatever. Well, this is what they're getting ready to get into. There, there is a plea, if you would, for a renewal of the covenant because Israel had walked away from God on a number of times. They had walked away from him. And as a result, they found themselves on the punishing end of the Lord's wrath. Look at the next section there, 38 through verse 45. Listen to what the Psalm says. But you have cast off and abhorred. You have been furious with your anointed. You have renounced the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. You have broken down all his hedges. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by the way plunder him. He is a reproach to his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword and have not sustained him in battle. You have made his glory cease and cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth you have shortened. You have covered him with shame. Now, now we see what the problem is. They are appealing to God because they are now suffering. They are appealing to him because of the punishment that they are going through. Pick any point in history uh, during the, the time period of the children of Judah, the southern nation. Any point in time when they have walked away from God. With everything you said you would do for David, he says, you cast us off and abhorred us. You have been furious with your anointed. You know, Manasseh, one of the uh, descendants of David. Was God happy with Manasseh? Absolutely not. God abhorred Manasseh because of what he led the children into. Think about Solomon. Solomon is supposed to be the wisest man. But what caused Solomon to, to lose favor with God? Well, it was the many wives, in his, wives within his life. And not just the many wives within his life, but he loved them more than God and allowed them to lead his heart into bringing idolatry into the lives of the Jewish or the people of Judah there. And so there comes punishment. There comes division. Um, even David, with the consequence of his sin with Bathsheba, his house was going to be divided. Which meant somewhere down the road, one of his sons, Absalom, was going to try to steal the throne from him. And what Absalom did was horrific against David. And finally, David was able to take the throne back. But still, all of these were consequences. So the people going through this suffering basically saying to God, you've turned your back on us. Remember the promises that you have made. You've broken down all his hedges. You've brought his strongholds to ruin. And then all who pass by the way plunder him. Basically, you've taken the nation of, of your people and you left them open 
for the people of the world to come in and to plunder and to abuse. You've exalted the right hand of his adversary. You know, one time he promised to exalt the right hand of David. But now because of what's going on, his adversary has been lifted up against his people. In our historical studies, we've seen that happen time and time again. Study through Isaiah, you see it happening. Um, God raised up the Assyrians, then he punished the Assyrians. He raised up the Babylonians, then he punished the Babylonians. They were all tools to help punish his people, to help turn his people back to his way time and time again. You've also turned back the edge of his sword and have not sustained him in the battle. Um, it reminds me of the, the case of point of the city of Ai. You remember the city of Ai? When they originally, and this was long before David was serving as king, but they had finally, Joshua, through the Lord, led the people into the promised land. First city they came to was Jericho. And they had a great defeat over the All they had to do was march around the walls, keep marching, 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 finally blow the trumpets, make a shout, and the walls came tumbling down, as the songs go. And so they kind of got a big head. Ai is a small city. Ask the next one, let's go take it. And they go against Ai and they get whooped. And the reason is, because Achan. Achan had plundered, taken home some plunder from the destruction of Jericho that was not supposed to have been. And as a result, sin was in the camp and it caused them to be defeated. And so here we have people die in battle because God wasn't there. So we have a similar thing and kind of painted there in verse 44. You have also turned back the edge of his sword and have not sustained him in battle. Well, there was sin back with Achan. And there was sin during this time period that caused the Lord to turn away from them. All who passed by the way, plunder him. And we talked about this. Um, sorry, that was 43 about the sword. Verse 44, you have made his glory cease. And cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth you have shortened. Now verse 44 really helps us to maybe identify when this psalm may have been written. At least a time frame here. You have made his glory cease and cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth you have shortened. You have covered him with shame. At what point did there cease to be a king over Judah? And that's with Babylonian captivity. So if we to try to put this into a time period maybe even as late maybe even into the return um or maybe de written during captivity let's say because look at this last part the prayer for renewal notice what we read here beginning of verse 46 now we've been singing this psalm going a long time a lot of history where there with this psalm we've acknowledged what we have done against god and, and acknowledge that he's walked away from us so now here's the plea to God. How long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what futility have you created um, all the children of men? What, can, what man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? Kind of the idea is they view that this is very, they're coming to the end. There's nowhere else for them to turn. They need the Lord to step in and restore his fellowship with them one more time. Their time is short. The creation of man has become futile in a matter of speaking there. Can man deliver his life from the power of the grave? And the answer, of course, is no. So, Lord... Where are your former loving kindnesses, which you swore to David in your truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of your servants, how I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples, with which your enemies have reproached, O Lord, with which they have reproached the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Now we get to the point and the problem. They have sinned against God. They have walked away from God. And now in this psalm, they're reminding God of all that he's done, the promises to David, and now their punishment, and now appealing to the Lord to allow them back in. And look at verse 50. I like the way this is worded. He says, remember, Lord, the reproach of your servants, 
how I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples with which your enemies have reproached, O Lord, with which they have reproached the footsteps of your anointed. They're reminding the Lord, or at least in the psalm, appealing to the Lord to remember his promise to David in that covenant and to no longer have them at the mercy of their enemies, but to restore them in New Testament terminology back to fellowship. And then the psalm closes in verse 52. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. So what about us? How, how could this psalm relate to us? Could we sing this type of psalm within our worship? Um, I think so from the standpoint, if we recognize that the possibility of sin exists within our life. And if we stop and think about what God has forgiven us of when we became a child of God. But in this case in point, they were immediately suffering. They were going through some immediate trials very well. Could have been during the Babylonian captivity, wanting to know when will they restore them. Someone may be asking that question today. But what scenario would create, what situation would create a person asking God for restoration back to his fellowship? Think about that. What situation in your life would put you into that position where you're asking God to once again let you walk in fellowship with him? It's recognizing that you've been separated from him because of sin. And oftentimes the last thing people want to do is to admit when they are wrong and that when they have walked away. And sometimes that's the hardest decision to make, that you've got to make the change and come back. But there have been many people, I fully believe many Christians who have walked away at some point and found themselves, much like the, um, the parable of the prodigal son, find themselves separated from the church, separated from the body, separated from all those who strive to walk in righteousness and realize like the son that they have walked away and made the mistake. And so at this moment, they're praying to God for a restoration of his fellowship, praying to him to accept them back if they will simply come back. And so when we look at that, maybe a twofold message could be, could be gleaned from this. First off, look at your own life. If you find that you're living a life that is contrary to the will of God, then come back to him tonight. You may be saying there, why does it feel like I've reached rock bottom, Lord, and you haven't done anything to stop it? It may simply be the case in point that you need to return to him first. And as you return to him and you start making the amends and the reparations within your life of whatever you've done wrong and turning away from him, you come back, you begin to make those things right. You, be, you are then restored to fellowship with the Lord through that repentance. But do you know someone that has walked away like the prodigal son? You know, I know John tells us not to say a prayer for someone who commits a sin that leads to death. But the idea of if you know someone who's walked away from the Lord, let's try to bring them back. There was no one here to bring Israel back, to bring Judah back, but the Lord himself. And folks like Daniel and, and, and Ezekiel and others who would have been encouraging the people to listen and to repent and return. But your voice may be the very voice that someone will listen to if you know they too have walked away. So something to think about as you contemplate Psalm 89. If you're not a Christian, we encourage you to become a child of God tonight. Make the decision to turn away from your sinful life, obey his command, be baptized, so you rise up then to walk in a newness of life. Now, having been added to his fellowship, to the body of Christ, walk in that fellowship. Be faithful until death. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully, and maybe you're wondering why things are going wrong within your life, come back to the text. Come back to the Lord in humble repentance. And you'll find that things will then be resumed as they should be before. As you walk in fellowship with God, all your sins being forgiven. If you're subject to the Gospels, invitation, would you come forward as we stand and as we sing?